Good morning. It's a profound pleasure to be here this morning and, and this weekend. Thank you to Pastor Finney for this invitation and for um, a couple others who were instrumental in making this work. Uh, my, my family and I are here and we are really, really privileged to be here. This is where we live, so welcome to Maryland. You guys are from New York, so welcome to Maryland. We stay just an hour south from here. So this is our home state. The verse that has been given to me for this weekend is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And it's a very common verse, and we probably all know it by heart. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, we probably know this verse by heart, and we've heard numerous sermons on it. Um, so. Let's see what we have this weekend. So this is something that Jesus told uh, people many times. And in multiple conversations, he said this. And um, there are three things that each follower of Jesus must be prepared to do if they want to follow him. And there are three things in this. And over the next three sermons, we will look at these three things. One of the poets of our time wrote these words. Started to cry, but then remembered I, I can buy myself flowers. Write my name in the sand. Talk to myself for hours. Say things you don't understand. I can take myself dancing, and I can hold my own hand. Yeah, I can love me better than you can. That was Miley Cyrus from her 2023 song, Flowers. This morning in a sermon in entitled, I, Me, Myself. I want to look at the issue of the self it's desire and denial. I've divided the sermon into four parts. In the first part, we will look at the identity of the self. In the second part, we will look at the elevation of the self. In the third part, very quickly, we will look at the desire of the self. And fourthly, we will look at the denial of the self. First, let's look at the identity of the self. Turn your Bibles for this and the next section to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 talks about the identity of the self. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27. And let me read it for us. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So now we're gonna look at the nature of a person. Who are we? Who are we? I wanna tell you four things from this part of Genesis that talks about who we are, what is our identity. First, we are created in God's image, created in God's image. All other, all other creation he spoke into being, the only creation that he actually formed with his hands is humans. And so it says here that he created, God created man in his image after his likeness. Now, what does in our image mean? Now the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians at that time in their society, only a king was called as being in the image of God. So it is possible that the writer of Genesis is saying that God is considering humans as royal when it says that we are made in the image of God. The biblical account gives worth and dignity to all people. And this is slightly different than other religions. So for example, of course, in the Islamic faith, they copy the biblical worldview in terms of creation. But in Hinduism, they say that uh, humans are created from the body parts of Brahma, who is the creator God. And in atheism and secular humanism, well, we all evolved from inanimate biochemical particles. And so there is no worth or dignity as is seen in the Christian faith. And then it says that we were created in the likeness of God. You see that phrase? So there are two phrases there, in our image and in our likeness. Why does it say in our likeness? It seems to be that this phrase in our likeness is used to qualify the first phrase 
in the image of God, in our image. It can't be that we are exactly in the image of God. And, so, and to dull that phrase down a little bit, this phrase in the likeness is used. We are not in the exact image of God. We are only in the likeness of God. You see, because there is only one person who is in the exact image of God. And in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, you don't need to turn to it. Let me read the verse for you. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 reads, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. There is only one person who is in the exact image of God, and that is Jesus Christ. The rest of us are in the image of God after his likeness. We are in the likeness of God. Now, this verse does not explain what that means. What does it mean to be in the image of God after his likeness? But there are many theories out there of what it could mean. Maybe it means that we have a mental capacity. Maybe it means that we have consciousness. Maybe it means that we can interact with God. Maybe it means that we have rational abilities to, to make arguments and sound arguments. But the text itself does not say what that means. The second identity of the self is purpose and calling. Purpose and calling. God made a beautiful world and wanted Adam and Eve to enjoy it, right? He could have made a world and said, well, all of you all just sit there and eat the fruit of the, tr of, of the trees and eat the animals that are there and, and enjoy yourself. But that's not what he did. He wanted us to be productive. Let's read a couple of verses. He gave Adam a task in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. It says, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So God gave the task of naming to Adam. Obviously, we don't know what language was used, what language God communicated with Adam, but we know that it was some language and Adam were, had the task of naming animals. Then God gave a continuous task. He gave the stewardship of creation. So there was one task of naming the animals and then a continuous task. So if you read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Obviously, this required more intelligence than all the other creatures that God had made. And let me read one more verse to show you that God actually wanted people to work. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, it says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. That means a time was coming when there would be a person to work the ground. Adam and Eve were vegetarians, and so they didn't have to, you know, they just had to sit around, get the fruit of the trees, and then have dominion over creation. It was only after Noah, after the flood in Noah, that God allowed them to eat animals. We don't know why. We don't know why. Maybe God wanted the animals to fill the earth a little bit before humans went and kind of demolished them, but we don't know why. I grew up in Bangalore in South India, and for summer vacation, we would go to Kerala, where my parents' hometown um, uh, was. And so, on the last day of our summer vacation, they would cook one of the chickens. Okay, they had a chicken coop, and one of the chickens would be our dinner. And so that afternoon on the last day, there would be this chicken happily you know, pecking around, and then by dinner, it was on our table as a chicken curry. Obviously, the first time that happened, that was very unnerving to me, you know, that, well, wow, that chicken, you remember the chicken that was there, you know, walking around, the red one with, you know, black hair or whatever? Well, this is it. So the first time it happened, it was unnerving to us, and maybe that's what uh, happened to Noah the first time. And God said, well, you guys are now free to go and eat uh, animals mm -hmm. when you've never eaten animals before. The third part of our identity is our relationship with God our relationship with God. 
the unique creation of humans reflect our capacity to have a relationship with God. It was Saint Augustine who said, God loves each of us as if there was only one of us. We find our worth in communion with God. The Bible doesn't specify exactly what kind of communion Adam and Eve had with God. It just says after the fall that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. So we just assume from that statement that God used to walk in the garden in the cool of the day before the fall and had communion with Adam and Eve. A fourth part of our identity is relationship with one another. We were created with the need to have relationship with one another, to have human relationships and companionship. And so Eve was created soon after Adam was created. And if you remember the story of creation, all of that happened on the sixth day. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 is the key verse that talks about any future marriage from that point on. It says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And if you notice the sequence of the events in that verse, it is completely different than the way we do marriages today. Let me read it again. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now there are two words in the Hebrew that are used there. One is the word leave and the other is the word for hold fast. And both of these words are covenantal terms. And the word for leave has been used throughout the Old Testament where God accuses the Israelites of leaving his covenant. They left his covenant. And the, and the other word for hold fast is, is used multiple times to show the maintenance of a covenantal relationship. So both those words are used for a covenantal relationship. So marriage in a way is breaking off one relationship, one covenantal relationship and holding fast to another one. You end one loyalty of sorts and then you begin another one. And that is our identity. What's our identity? It is created in the image and likeness of God, called for a productive purpose and to be in relationship with God and others. Second, let's look at the elevation of the self. At the elevation of the self. What happened at the fall? What happened at the fall? Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. Let me read the verse for us. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. So when the woman saw that tree was good, that the tree was good for food and that was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The temptation to Eve was all about the self. Right? It was all about the self. It was good for food, it was a delight to see, it would make me wise. And so it was all about the self. At the fall, the self was placed on the throne. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And this is a description of a person where the self is on the throne. And it says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. John Phillips in his book Exploring Romans writes this about the human condition. He says, man's power to think lifts him above the beasts of the field. In this age of scientific enlightenment and advanced technology, we have every evidence that man has a brilliant intellect. 
Yet at the same time, it is strangely clouded to spiritual realities. For despite his genius in so many realms, man betrays a most remarkable denseness when it comes to the things of God. He has no natural understanding of this realm at all. His mind, so incisive in so many ways, is warped and twisted when it comes to eternal and spiritual issues. The damage wrought by sin runs deep into the very roots of his thinking process. His imaginations are often filthy, his memories often betray him, his deductions are often false, and his conclusions are often wrong. The self was elevated at the fall. How did our identity change when the self was elevated? How did our identity change when the self was elevated? I want to go back to the four things that we said earlier and I want to compare what happened at the fall to our identity. How did our identity change with the fall with God's image in us? Let me ask you a question. When the fall happened, did we lose God's image in us? No, no. Let me, let's look at a verse. Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. And this is a talk that God had with Noah right after the flood. And this is what he said. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So even after the fall, we carry the image of God, the likeness of God, even though it is marred. Second, the purpose. How, how did the fall affect our purpose? A purpose to work on earth has been significantly made difficult. One of the curses that God gave after the fall is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So God still wanted us to be productive, but now it's much harder. How about the relationship with God? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The fall caused a separation from God, right? And they had fear, and they had guilt, and they had shame. And when you have one of those three or all those three, it's a sign of sin. How many of you drove yesterday? I suppose all of you drove yesterday from, from New York. Okay, all of you drove yesterday? How many of you all saw a police car as you drove? How many of you saw a police car as, you, as you're driving? The rest of you, you all took the easy way out. The police car, all of you saw police, okay, wonderful. How many of you slowed down when you saw a police car? Slow down, right. We all slow down, that's right. If we never went above the speed limit ever, there is no reason ever to slow down, isn't it? There's no reason to be afraid when you see a cop car wondering, oh, what happened? You know, is he gonna come after me? You look in the rear view mirror, and then about half a mile later, you're like, oh, thank God he's not after me. <laughs> if, if we never sin, there is no need for fear or guilt or shame. And the fact that Adam and Eve and you guys had fear shows that we are sinners and that they sinned. How about the fourth part of our relationship with each other? How did that change with the fall and with the elevation of the self? Human relationship with one another got completely derailed. Let me read a verse which is actually a part of the curse. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, this is part of the curse to Eve. And this is what it says, Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. This was not how it was supposed to be. 
But when sin happened and the fall happened and the self was elevated, this is how it ended up being. There was a perverted relationship. And the first sin recorded outside of the Garden of Eden was an interpersonal sin between brother and brother where one brother killed another brother. We looked at the identity of the self. We looked at the elevation of the self. And very quickly, let's look at the desire of the self. The desire of the self. How does the self manifest itself today? The self is first in everything. Isn't it? Let me just read a verse. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Says, those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt passion and despise authority, reckless, self-centered, they speak abusively of angelic majesties without trembling. The underlying principle between every, for every decision that we make is how does this help me, isn't it? The cultural principle between every decision somebody makes is how does this make me happy? Of course, sometimes we want to do some things to help other people, and that's probably because we still have the marred uh, image and the likeness of God within us. But we won't help people if it hurts us too much. I've got a friend who is, um, they are missionaries in Tamil Nadu. Okay, so he's a Caucasian from Portland, Oregon, and his wife is from Tamil Nadu. She, her parents and her brother are missionaries in rural Tamil Nadu. And so my friend and his wife and their two kids are in Tamil Nadu as missionaries. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, and, and for this question, you don't need to raise your hand. How many of you would like to be a missionary for the next one year in rural Tamil Nadu? Okay, you don't need to raise your hand. Let me ask you a second question. And for this, you can, you can raise your hands. How many of you, if I said, I will give you $2 million if you are a missionary in rural Tamil Nadu for the next one year? Some of you? $2 million? No? What, 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 what's it going to cost me to, to, to get you to rural Tamil Nadu? Let me ask you a third question. What if I said instead of the $2 million, after the end of the first year, you will be killed? Now, how many of us would want to go to rural Tamil Nadu? You see, there's a difference in how much we help people. There is a limit to it, all right? At the bottom of every decision we make, is the unsaid question, or the unsaid principle, how does this benefit me? How does this bring me happiness? The primary desire of the self is for the self. That is the primary desire. Fourthly and finally, let's look at the denial of the self. The old self is not compatible with God because there is place for only one person on the throne, not for two people on the throne. Either God is on the throne or I am on the throne. There is no place for two people on the throne. When a person becomes a believer, Christ gets on the throne. And so Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We have a new identity when we are a believer because we are now in Christ. And that means that we are dead to our old self. And we have a new nature, we have a new purpose, we have a new relationship with God and a new basis for relationship with other people. Let me ask a question. Why self-denial? 
Why should we have self-denial? The reason why we have self-denial is because we are positionally in Christ, but not practically in Christ. Yes, we are in Christ. A part of us is, is turned toward Christ. A part of us is turned towards his precepts. But practically, we are not. We are turned away. And that is why we need self-denial. Let's turn uh, your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 and verses 16 and 17. And let me read it for us. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the f desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to one another, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see what it says? It says that the spirit of God and our spirit is, goes in one direction, and the flesh goes in another direction. Not that it goes in tangent close to each other, but in completely opposite directions. And so because of that, because we are practically not turned toward God, we need self-denial. And then the question comes, how do we do self-denial? And to show us how to do self-denial, I'm going to draw a contrast between two apostles. First, let me take you to the garden in the palace of the high priest, where Peter was warming himself that Monday Thursday. And as he was warming himself, he had two options. He was asked certain questions, wasn't he? He had two options. And the two options were, uh, were choose Christ and deny myself, or deny Christ and choose myself. Right? Those were the two options. Choose Christ, and if I chose Christ, I would have to deny myself, or I deny Christ, and in deny Christ, I'm choosing myself. And of course, he chose to deny Christ and put himself up there. Let me end with three verses, and I want to talk about Paul. How did Paul deny himself? Let's read three verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. I protest, brothers, but my, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What is Paul doing? He is denying himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Another version says, I beat my body and make it my slave. To deny, to deny oneself is to say no to the self and yes to God in every circumstance. So we need to say no to the self. Right? That's easy. That's as straightforward as it gets. So we should start saying no to the self. When you study mathematics, the first lesson you study in mathematics is not calculus, right? You study addition and subtraction, and then multiplication, and then division, and then square root, and then you know everything else. So if we are learning how to deny ourselves, Start saying no to the small stuff. Start saying no to the small stuff. Before we, before we come to a position where we have to choose between life and death, let's start with the small stuff. Maybe you wake up in the morning and uh, you're going to deny yourself the $7 burnt coffee from Starbucks that, that, that takes you know, 20 minutes to get. Maybe you'll say no to that. Start with the small stuff. Start with the small stuff. The next time you want to do something, try saying no. See what happens. Something really small. And then you can build it up. We tell no to our kids. And for good reason. Sometimes they want to do stuff that we don't want them to do. So we say no to some small stuff. Sometimes we tell no to our kids 
just to say no. I know that sounds terrible because my kids are listening to this. But we <laughs> say no to our kids just to say no so that they can know what it means to see, to hear, or know. Of course, what they don't understand is if they themselves said no to the self and its desires, we would stop saying no as parents. Jesus is the greatest example of self-denial, isn't he? The verse that we started off at the beginning, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone come, wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This verse came immediately after Jesus predicted his own death. He was not asking us to deny ourselves without him denying himself. On February 14, 2018, a mass shooting occurred at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. 17 children were killed and 14 more were taken to hospitals, making it one of the worst school massacres. The perpetrator was 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz, and they arrested him shortly after. One of the victims was Peter Wang was 15 years old. He was a member of the Reserve Officers Training Corps and his, his life desire was to be a soldier. When he died, he was accepted into the West Point Academy. Why was 15-year-old Peter Wang accepted into the prestigious West Point Academy? You see, ladies and gentlemen, when the shooting began, and everybody started to run. Peter Wang did not. What he did was that he went there, opened the door, and held the door open as all his classmates started to run. And as he stood there holding the door open, he absorbed in his body more bullets than any other student, including one to the head. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve put themselves first. And about 2,000 years ago, Jesus held that door open and absorbed in his body the entire force of the wrath of God. As he held the door open, he denied himself and he put us first. I want to give a time for us to respond to this sermon. I want us to close our eyes. And I want to ask two questions. What areas of our lives do we need to surrender to Jesus? In which area of your life have you never said no to the desires of the flesh? One of the three criteria that Jesus gives for us to follow him is to deny the self. I want you to think of some areas in your life that you're going to decide to say no. It may be a normal desire, but we are going to practice to say no so that we can deny ourselves. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning that you've given us. Thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence. Thank you for the privilege of spending some time in beautiful worship. I, I pray that our worship was beautiful in your years. I thank you that though that you have made us upright, you made us upright, but unfortunately we, we were seeking ourselves and we put the self first and we continue to do that in spite of being believers and in spite of being a new creation and in spite of being positionally in Christ, we continue to seek the desires of the flesh. 
I pray that you would help us to decide to say no. Help us, like Paul said, to beat our body and make it our slave, so that it is not the, the flesh that decides what happens to me, but the spirit that decides what happens to me. I pray that your word would continue to speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.